Now in its 10th year, this is GabNet. Talk like you've never heard it before. This is Alex. This is the Ramble coming to you live from New York City. The city you see right below you until midnight tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, out to the west coast of the United States, we talked to Larry Brown. Hello, Larry. Okay, yes, back to your old hometown. Yes. Oh, by the way, I, what was I watching about San Francisco? Uh, God, I was watching something, and it was, I think it was all about how filthy San Francisco has gotten. And it, I, yeah. I, I look back at my old hometown, and it, like, I'm getting depressed, just really depressed. Well, I don't think it's probably any worse than any other major city at this point. So. Yeah, really, but... It's San really Fr- bad down by the Tenderloin and Union Square. Didn't but. San Francisco used to kind of be a refuge from all of that? Yeah, the West Coast city used to be the cleanest I mean, I was watching a documentary last night on the San Francisco music and the sound and everything. You know, Jefferson Airplane, Grateful Dead, and uh, all of that. And um, it it was, even when it was back then and it was that whole period where they took over the Haight-Ashbury and they lived 20 people to a, to a Victorian and whatever, it was still kind of interesting because it was so out there. And people were being so experimental about their lives, about their music, and whatever, that I can only think of the other renaissance in San Francisco that took place was a few years later when I got there, and you had the comedy boom. Right, yeah. It was kind of, in other words, things could always boom there if they were unusual and different. And um, I I miss that. that. That San Francisco doesn't exist anymore. No, it's kind of a bunch of tech people that don't seem to have much of a humor. <laughs> yeah, well, tech people are are the down, aren't they? The downfall of that city, basically. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, they caused the rents to go crazy, and because they would come in and say, "I want that apartment. How much you want to pay for it?" Oh, I don't care. I'm, I'm making a fortune down in uh, Silicon Valley. What well, do you yeah, want? I'll to give try? you six months of rent in, in advance. They want six months' rent in advance? Some, some of them would offer that, so that's how they get Oh, them. okay. All right. You know. But, I mean, it just, uh, I, I, I don't know. I just feel very sad when I see what perceptively from here has happened to that town. Now, it may be different for you because you live there, you know. Yeah, and uh, I didn't grow up here when you did, but I did see a book recently. There were so many neat things in San Francisco that, uh, like this, you probably, the Flyshacker Pool was the world's largest swimming pool. That no longer exists, right? It's gone. It was like an Olympic pool, I think, is 100 meters. The Flyshacker Pool was 1,000 feet. Yeah, it was the biggest pool in the world, and it was a saltwater pool. Heated seawater, yeah. Yeah, Heated seawater. I never swam in it because I didn't like going to a pool that had salt water in it, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I kind of felt like I was, you know, when I get into it, I it would feel like a swamp, you know. But and plus, Did you ever uh, ride the old tea train? The what? <laughs> the key train. The tea train? Key train that used to go across the Golden Gate Bridge. Oh, key the, train. Bay Bridge. The Bay yes, Bridge. I did. It was under the uh, current... It, it, you you have on two levels deck. on that bridge now. The bottom level used to be the train. Yeah. And, and it I, looked like a really good system. It served all over the East Bay. and. Oh, yeah. It was terrific. But they needed that bottom level because traffic was getting so ridiculous. Okay? So uh, they I can't remember when they did that. I think they must have done that while I was away in the Navy or something like that. But they completely got rid of the trains took out the tracks put in a road bed and that was it you know yeah i saw a picture of the bay bridge the upper deck was like uh, two-way traffic it was weird 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, uh, uh, there were times in San Francisco where, uh, what were some of the things I remember as a kid uh, that just aren't even there now? I mean, I was in, uh, I lived in North Beach, and it was an all-Italian neighborhood, okay? In fact, all my, all my friends up and down Filbert Street, I'd go to their homes, and in the basement, they had a wine vat. <laughs> really, I'm serious. They had wine vats. And then all of a sudden, the Chinese started moving into the neighborhood and buying up all the property. And so it became essentially a Chinese neighborhood. And we moved out because our Chinese uh, landlord wanted us to move out because he needed the place for the rest of his family. So that's when we moved to Marin County. You know. my, uh, my big move. Well, my pa- father's parents died and willed us a home in Mill Valley. Okay. He was their only son that was left, so he got the whole estate. And so he had they had this house in Mill Valley, and it was a nice little house. It was a simple house. Uh, and uh, my parents felt it was too small for them to live in, that they wanted something bigger. So they moved f- further into Marin and bought a house there, uh, using the proceeds from the, uh, the house in Mill Valley. So that's how we got to Marin. And uh, there I grew up, you know. What what part of Mill Valley were you in? I can't remember now. We were up in the hills. I could, if you if you and I were in Mill Valley, I could show you where it was. You know that 3 a.m. club? Yeah, yeah. If you turn onto that road, the 3 a.m. club, go down about three streets or two streets, then turn right and then go up into the hills a little bit. That's where we lived. So, so that house would probably be worth two, three million now. <laughs> well, I doubt if it's there anymore. The thing was, there was this whole property behind it. It was on an acre. Jesus. Uh, yeah. And uh, when I went back there a few years ago, there was nothing up there, right? Mm-hmm. Then there was. they had built a road up there. They built houses in there. Uh, I think um, whoever bought the property sold off half of the acre so that they could, you know, build homes and things like that. And all of that had changed, you know. So, I mean, it's amazing how things change, how you yeah, go back you to them. can't buy a house in Mill Valley for under a million. Well, if I took you up there in a car, I'd try to find where the house was, and I don't think we could find it anymore, you know. And um, uh, what was the other thing that I used to do that it, it just completely changed? Uh, the whole amount of property in back of it had changed. So, you know, things, that happens. You know, that happens. And uh, I just looked up my home in San Anselmo, and I I did a a thing on um, Google to see with Google um, Maps if I could find it, and I found the house. And it's still there, only they've extended it a bit. But, uh, you know... But that's where I grew up. I had a great, I had a great childhood. You, you sound like you probably had a pretty good childhood, right? Uh, suburban in Ohio. Yeah, it was good. Though. I mean, you didn't have an alcoholic father or anything. No, like that. I, yeah. No, no. I know so many people at comics. especially seem like they had really bad parents. So I guess I was lucky. Well, uh, do you think comedy comes out of having bad parents? I think it would stem from that. Sure. Wow. Don't you? It's like uh, people laugh to overcome adversity. I guess. I mean, I don't. God, I mean, I came from a. Uh, I came from a good family. You know, I mean, it's just yeah. me, my father, and my mother. But it was a good family. Uh, my father uh, was quite a drinker when he worked with the bands, but then when he left uh, being a musician, uh, he quit drinking. Uh, you know, it's very easy to drink, when, in, especially in those days when you were with a band, because there are these guys who want to impress their girlfriend. You go, buy the band a drink. And so all of a sudden, you, about five people do that in a given night, and you're, you're on your heels. And my father um, did, uh, drank pretty, pretty well in those days, uh, but he didn't get drunk. 
My he didn't father, get violent. <laughs> no, he didn't get violent, nothing. He never got, but he said he never really got drunk. For some reason, his metabolism was great and he could have five drinks and never feel it. Well, he said, one day I started feeling them. He said, and that's the day I decided to quit. And he just quit. Wow. Didn't go to Alcoholics Anonymous or anything like that. He just quit. And uh, never had another drink in his life. You that's know, amazing. And, yeah, well, I mean, I, I think I got that from my father because any drug I ever got hooked on, one day I would just say, I'm going to quit. And I quit. You know, and um, so, uh, you know, I think I got that from my father. But I was always, I was always amazed at that when he quit drinking. That he just boom, he quit smoking the same way. He That's smoked, really he smoked, tough. He smoked two packs a day. One day he said, "This is no good for me," and he stopped smoking. Jesus. He's strong-willed. Well, I think there is a difference. I, um, you know, years ago I had a friend named Abby Hoffman, uh, and the only reason I'm bringing up a 60s radical is because he really his uh, he was studied for and was a clinical psychologist and he wrote several books involved with a lot of the stuff of clinical psychology and one of them was about about addiction and I said to him I said you know why is it that I know people who are addicted to drugs or addicted to smoking, for instance. A good example would be smoking. It is an addiction. And I said, and they never quit. They have a hard time quitting. And that any of these things that I've gotten hooked on, I just quit. I just stopped. And he said, that's because you don't have an addictive personality. He said, there are people who can just stop any drug they're on, even no matter how much they do it, because they're not, their body is not craving that as a part of an addiction. And so you're different than the people who are truly addicted. And that's why you're able to quit. Because I quit smoking, I quit Coke, I quit, for the most part, I quit pot because I just stopped doing it. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to think what else I might have been addicted to. Well, you know, uh, cigarettes, I think, were probably the hardest. That's what I, I never smoked, but I heard that's really hard to quit. Well, I did it. I did it when I was at uh, the uh, the, um, the uh, what do you call it? The Quake. Um, had a guy on, came by one day, said, uh, "How are your lungs doing?" I said, "My lungs are doing fine." He said, "Let's do a little test." I did the test. He said, "Your lungs are impaired from smoking." Wow. That day, I went home. I thought about it. Went up the street to the drugstore and bought a thing called uh, Bantron, which were little pills you would take whenever you felt you were desiring a cigarette. And I took the Bantron for a couple of days, and I quit. And one of the things that made me quit is that I didn't say, I'm trying to see if I can quit. I said, I'm going to see how long I can go without smoking. So I didn't put a challenge in front of myself. I just said, I'm going to see how long I can go without smoking. And now it's been like 45 years. So, you know, uh, apparently it worked. But I wow. just I just quit, and that was the last cigarette I ever had. That's and, great. Yeah, and uh, I don't know who that guy was that took that test with me, but I want to thank him. Because if I kept smoking... Uh, I would probably not be talking to you right now. You know. Good chance, yeah. Well, I, you know, I, people said to me, uh, they said, well, you know, I know people that have smoked all their lives and never got cancer. I said, yeah, but that's not the only thing that will kill you from smoking. You know, there are a lot of other things. Cigarettes, believe it or not, I think I heard only accounted for 5% of all the deaths from cancer, uh, from lung cancer. Uh, environmental situations, all kinds of things can can also attribute to lung cancer. So, um, you know, but I think I, I think that guy saved my life. You know. Yeah, smoking can give you kidney and bladder cancer. 
you can get bladder cancer, you can get kidney cancer. I had one doctor, he was a urologist, and he said to me, he said, uh, you got to have a, 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 what do you call it, where they go in and they look at your bladder, a cystoscopy. And I went, why? He said, well, you did, uh, you did smoke cigarettes. I said, but I stopped like 30 years ago. This was 20 years ago when he did this. I said, I quit like 30 years ago. And he said, yeah, but at that time you smoked of uh, 40, uh, what is it, 40 cigarettes a day uh, because I would smoke two packs. And he said, you could have bladder cancer. And I said, yeah. you mean to tell me I quit th- like 30 years ago and I could have bladder cancer now? He said, yep. I said, wow. and why did I ever quit? I was enjoying smoking. <laughs> and he looked at me, gave me a weird look. And uh, but he was a lousy doctor. He should have never done a cystoscopy on me. But he said that you know bladder cancer is a result of smoking. So you know, but I think I'm out of the woods. I would think <laughs> yeah. so. Yeah. At 84, I think I'm out of the woods. Jesus. Yeah. But and so, don't forget all the damage it does to your arteries and heart. And- oh, God. Yeah. But I'm. I'm ha- listen. I'm. Uh, the, I often say to Marjorie, and she says the same thing about herself, the greatest thing I ever did was stop smoking. You know, And I don't know that many. Do you know any people who smoke anymore? Not anymore. I think it's less than 20% of the Americans smoke. But And usually the smokers that I have seen are women. Yeah. Women seem to like to smoke. And if they don't smoke like uh, we used to. Did you ever smoke? No. No. I used to smoke two packs a day, if you may remember, in the very beginning. I don't remember you smoking, but that's when I first met you was at the Quakes. Yeah, so you may have met me after I quit. Mm -hmm. You know, Uh, I found after three weeks, I said to somebody, they said, how are you doing on quitting smoking? I said, I'm never going to smoke again. And they said, how do you know? And I said, because I went to this much trouble to quit. Why should I do it again? You know? So I just never went back to smoking. That was it, you know. I never drank. Never a drinker. I can't I can't tell you. I probably if I had to tell you, I could tell you on all the fingers on both my hands how many drinks I've had in my lifetime. Oh, me too. You're not a drinker either. No, I would say I've had less than 10 drinks. Because you 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 work in clubs. You would think yeah. you'd be a drinker. Oh, everyone's giving me alcohol, and I don't. I don't want it. Yeah, yeah. But you, you did you ever do any kind of drug at all? Uh, when I first started comedy, everybody was doing cocaine in the eighties, and I tried that a couple of times and didn't like it. Didn't, didn't actually didn't do anything for me. Yeah, yeah. I I really liked it. You know. Uh, oh, I know some people just loved it. Yeah, yeah, I really, I really liked it, and I, I used it in the morning to do a morning show to wake up. You know, uh, that was when I was at the when I was at early days of Live One Hundred Five, the first uh, go round at Live One Hundred Five, and then when I moved to Miami, I quit cocaine. Now you've, I know you find that unusual. Because that's where it all was, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, but, you know, I lost all the people who had it. No. So, uh, and I had access to it. So I, I I, didn't do it, really. I did it once, I think, down there, because I hung around with some comics, and they had some. But I had decided that once I hit the Florida border, I wasn't going to have another, you know, I wasn't going to do coke ever again. And when I came back uh, to San Francisco... Uh, I wasn't doing coke anymore. I wasn't doing anything anymore. I wasn't smoking. I didn't drink. I would. I nothing. I was we're a like bo- our lives are about as exciting as Mike Pence. Well, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we have a Mike Mike Pence kind of <laughs> existence. But uh, geez, I mean, uh, so I came back basically drug free. Wasn't smoking, wasn't doing coke, didn't drink. Uh, I can't think of anything I did at that point. You know, maybe a little pot now and then. You know, I, I never thought pot was anything to worry about. 
The only thing is, I would never do pot before I work. Uh, because, what, what because, is hashish? Well, hashish is a form of cannabis, but it, it's grown in uh, uh, Africa, in Morocco. Uh, and it is, I've had it. Um, uh, no, I haven't had hashish. I have had, I've had, I've uh, had, uh, what was the other thing? It came in a little bar of, uh, uh, see, I'm forgetting all the drugs, too. <laughs> yeah, uh, but many. hashish was this drug in Morocco, and I knew these guys who, who went to Morocco a lot and did hashish, and I said, why don't I, can't I ever lay my hands on hashish? And they say, because it doesn't travel well. In other words... It just doesn't, it has a very low life expectancy, and you have to do it in Morocco if you're really going to do it. So, uh, in fact, uh, this one guy I knew who was a drug smuggler, who smuggled, uh, um, what's the other thing? Not hashish, the other thing. Uh, oh, God, maybe, oh, God, I can't remember. I can't remember the other drug. Maybe it was hashish. Maybe I'm thinking of something else. I don't know. I'm my mind is gone largely, Larry. So <laughs> please excuse me. Wait a minute. We had marijuana, and then he had a bar a bar of uh, was was that hashish? I can't remember. No. But anyway, when you would go to a place like um, uh, Ibiza, uh, they had this these bars of of, of cannabis. And I can't remember what it was called. And I, why is my mind a blank on that? God, it's ridiculous. But anyway, um, they, that was the only thing they had in Ibiza. And when I would come, they'd say, do you have any marijuana on you? Because they really missed marijuana because that form of cannabis kind of had a really heavier feeling to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, so, but I'm trying to remember, what, what was that drug called? I'll have to ask Marjorie. She'll remember. Although she doesn't remember anything either. To us, we're watching movies, and it's just that guy who was in that thing. <laughs> you know. <laughs> totally lose our, our mental capacities completely. You know. <laughs> Do you find yours is going at all? Oh, yeah, yeah. Really? Like, what, what kind of things don't you remember well? Uh, I, names. You what? And I don't remember anyone's name names. That I, names, yeah. I'm names terrible on I, names. You know. And, and Marjorie. And sometimes people come up to me in a club and uh, they act like they know me and I don't remember their face. So it's. Well. Forgetting names and faces. Well, they may be people you only met once, you know. Possible, yeah. It's amazing. You have this great memory for other stuff, but names are a problem for you. Names are always a problem. That's very selective, you know. Yeah, like, like I remember numbers, but not names. I will find that if I'm not pressured to come up with something with a name or something, it will come right out of me. But if all of a sudden they say, "Who is that guy that you did that thing with?" I can't remember the name. Mm -hmm. If I'm pressured to come up with a name, I can't. Uh, but sometimes I'll be having discussions with people. I'll be coming up with names of people, you know. I, all over the place and then all of a sudden if I'm pressured now but who was that guy that did that I go um, uh, I can't remember so don't put any pressure on my brain folks I'm 84 <laughs> leave me the fuck alone exactly <laughs> you know and you get to be 84 I hope you have better memory okay but uh, anyway so everything else going good Bubs everything's good yes uh, the uh I got. I'll be working with Felipe Esparza Saturday. He's taping his fourth Netflix special. So. Oh, so you're going to be on it? I doubt if I'll be on it, but um. Oh, you're just a warm up, basically. Yeah, I've been, yeah. But, well, that's good. He hires you a lot. Yeah, and if he's done four Netflix specials, that means I must really like him because they're not. He must be getting great numbers. What's his he name again? Felipe Esparza. I'm going to have to check that out. I, yeah. I, I have Netflix, so I can see him. I'll check him out. But that's good. So you're working with him, and you're, you're, yeah, you're doing fine. You know, you're amazing. Uh, people, people like using you. 
Well, at this old age, yes. And then, you know, I think Steve Pearl's doing well, too, in Vegas. Oh, really? Yeah. I'll have he to... seems to be getting a lot of work, and he seems to still enjoy it. So. Yeah. Well, that's good, you know. And uh, I, was, I talked to Will Durst yesterday. In fact, I got to talk to him again today. Uh, he's uh, still in bed. Still in bed. But, uh, yeah, I, I recently I called Deb last week and I said, "Hey, could we'll do a set at the Throckmorton?" And she said, "He's not quite ready. I, I yeah. don't think he can stand up." Is that it? He, that's his problem. I mean, I guess he could do it in a wheelchair, but I think he yeah. wa- he wants to be able to stand up. Anyway, listen, we got to go. I I really enjoy this, Larry, and I can't tell you how much I uh, I appreciate your participation. Well, thanks for having me because no one else will. So. Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, the always popular Larry Bubbles Brown. Thanks, yeah. Larry. Bye. Now in its tenth year, this is Gadnet talk like you've never heard it before. And that was, of course, Larry Bubbles Brown. Yeah. Okay, all right. Uh, let me see here. We, we don't have that many people waiting to come on here tonight. I've, I've been saying that a lot lately. I don't know what to do about it. I don't know. I'm thinking maybe of doing away with the, the, the ramble, just all together, and doing the Monday thing, and maybe one other thing uh, that maybe will make this show available to other people. And then I'm going to take my... Um, my friends like uh, uh, like Blake Bubbles and uh, 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 Albert Reynoso and uh, Chuck Farnham and Laurie Thompson and fold them all into one show every week. So I don't know. I'm I'm considering a lot of things because this just ain't uh, ain't cutting it anymore. Uh, you know. And so here I have two people waiting for me. And one of them is, is really a, a, a great uh, person to discuss the topics of the day with, and another is just a nice person that I enjoy having here because he's just a nice guy and a friend. So let them, let's let them on, two of them. That's it. All two. Okay, there they are. There's, uh, there's Jeff, and there is Josh, the two J's, ladies and gentlemen. How are you, Jeff? I'm great. And uh, uh, Josh, how are you doing? Good, thank you. Yeah, you're doing fine? Okay, good. Um, you've been working a lot, but uh, uh, now you're off for a couple of days? Uh, yeah, two days. What's a few days, Saturday and Sunday? Yeah, yeah, two days, tonight, tonight and tomorrow night. Uh, tonight and tomorrow night. Oh, and then I you should go- have more off, but... Uh, I have to work a lot next week to cover for people who are off. So next week's going to be very tough. Oh, God. Okay. Well, that's what you get for leaving that place, right? Well, that's just the way it is. Of course, you said that you kind of liked leaving the place and coming back and taking a job that didn't put you as a, a, a what do you call it, a supervisor, right? Uh, yeah, I, I didn't want to do that anymore, you know, where I was. Um, uh, I, I could probably do it again where I am now, uh, for various reasons, but where I was, I, I didn't want to, so I wanted to come back to a group of people that I liked, uh, quite a bit more and just, were they, well, were they, ha- they happy to have you back? I would imagine. Yeah. Yeah. It's working out fine. You know, it's, uh, I just took what was available to get back in the building and then, you know, Whatever happens from there happens from there, but uh, you know, uh, and I'm actually, you know, with what I'm, I'm making, really the same money as I was making uh, where I left. Uh, you know, the place I was at for just a little over a year. So you know, everything financially uh, worked out. It's just been, it's just a different schedule. But you know, I've worked it before previous times in my life. So. Yeah, you know, I knew what it was going to be like. It just hasn't been too bad. So actually, you missed it, is what you did. Uh, the place that I was at, yeah. You know, I mean, don't get me wrong. I could, uh, I could probably live without, you know, the schedule. I mean, you know, this schedule. The thing about it is, is it's really great when you're off. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then you know, you have to go back 
you know, to work, you know. So, I mean, sometimes when your schedule falls on certain holidays and things like that, you end up with a lot of time off, and it doesn't cost you a dime. You don't you have to use any of your time off. It's just the way your schedule falls. You know, like at Memorial Day, for instance, I got a four-day break, you know, completely paid because that's the way it fell. So, you know, the, the week of the 4th of July, I only work one day in <laughs> seven. You know, and but I get full pay, so that's the way it works. But you know, also, mm-hmm. what you give up is sometimes things that people uh, think are sacred or whatever. For you know, like I said, for in in the month of June, I'm going to end up working three out of the four Sundays, which is not great. You know, but yeah. But let me ask you this question: What is your ideal job? Well. You know, I mean, I honestly kind of like the the job that I had before was pretty, pretty good fit. I mean, I'm I've I've always worked across the uh, a couple different groups within that company. I've worked, you know, for the maintenance and engineering side for a long time, and then I moved into what they call operations, you know, which is the actual production side. But as part of that job, I had a very large role in the supply chain. And, you know, I, I like the supply chain uh, a lot. I mean, I like it as much as I can like a job that doesn't involve teaching. Yeah, but, 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 uh, I think Harvard, what I was asking you was, if you had the ideal job, what would that job be? Uh, what do you mean outside of what I have now? I mean... It, it, in other words, tomorrow you could snap your fingers and get the kind of job you want. Well, I would write, I would write books and I would teach history at a... At a college somewhere and I don't, it doesn't even need to be a larger prestigious college or anything like that I, I'm not uh, concerned about that at all you know it just it would be nice to get paid to talk to people about that kind of stuff on a regular basis and then it would allow time for me to to write you know to turn some of my larger projects into into books you know basically so well, if you went to a college or a university uh, do you have a master's degree yet I have two, yes. Yeah, so you could teach at a college. I can, yes. Um, it is very difficult, however, to get jobs in my particular field um, without a PhD. So oh, it's okay. not, it isn't possible, but we're in a cycle right now where there are... Uh, a good amount of jobs available but there are far more candidates than there are jobs um you know so the colleges have their pick <clears throat> and they pretty much were in a cycle right now for the last year and a, or three or four years and it'll probably continue for a couple more where they will basically just virtually look right over anyone that doesn't have a phd you know i was talking to uh someone the other day uh, the guy that wrote this book, as a matter of fact, uh, he taught the last class that I took for a graduate certificate that I went back and got, you know, and I was talking to him about the issue and, you know, he just, he just confirmed, you know, what I, I said was he was just like, yeah, he's like, you know, you have a lot more education than someone with just a, a, an MA. You went back and got a second MA and then you got a graduate certificate on top of that. You're basically like three quarters of the way to a PhD, mm-hmm. and you're very capable. But the you know the problem is when you put these apps and resumes into the, some college somewhere, they don't know you. They've never met you. They don't take the time to talk to you because they get fifty applicants for the job, and they just go you know they flip through, and every one of them that doesn't say PhD next to their name, they literally just throw in the trash. So you know. I've been told in other fields like business, um, engineering, some of the other fields that they don't care about the PhD at all, that the MA is perfectly fine, Mm -hmm. um, and and you can get right into it. But that's not the field that I'm in, and it's also not the field that I would want to teach in. So, uh, Gee, I would love you to get a PhD, (laughs) then I could call you Dr. Wheeler. Well, um... I think you dropped off before uh, last Saturday or whatever, but right after that, you know, I've talked to those guys for the last couple of weeks that uh, I did get into a program that I'll start later this year uh, that will be for a PhD, and they transferred in a good bit of it, 
that I had because I had done so much work somewhere else. And so they will credit me for a lot of the courses. And I'll, I'll have to take about a dozen courses and a dissertation, and, and they'll confirm me a Ph.D. And so, how long will that take you to do? You know, I don't know. A uh, couple, three years at least. You know, the dissertation itself is on a timeline that you can't move up, and it's, it's at least a year. They make you write it for at least a year, the writing and research, so there's that. And then the second equation of it is, I also have to pay for it, you know, on my own. Mm -hmm. um, so I do need to spread it out a, a, a bit, you know, because it's my money. And I, I mean, I can't just shell out two or three thousand bucks for courses every, you know, constantly every two months or whatever. So um, I probably a couple of three years. Yeah. Well, you know, but <laughs> we're we're getting there. I mean, uh because it seems like that's where your life would like to go. Yeah, and you know, it's very close. I mean, I do have some contact, good people that are in the industry. You know, like I said, uh, Dr. Carpenter, you know, who, who wrote that book that I showed you that I've worked with before, uh, you know, he knows my work on the military history side, and he's published a lot. Um, he was in the Navy uh, for a long, long time. Um, he's very good friends with Admiral uh, James Stravitas, who was on NBC a lot as their military analyst and, you know, was the Supreme Allied Commander of NATO forces mm -hmm. uh, uh, up until a few years ago when he retired. Um, you know, so he's very in touch with the field. And, you know, he recognizes my work, and, and I'm sure that in the future – you know, there's someone that can help you with introductions and letters of recommendations and and things like that. But, you know, that's it's just we're just in a cycle where those colleges are just so picky in that particular department in that field, you know, that it's 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 tough, you know. I mean I it's just it's different. Tough. Every industry is different, right? Radio, broadcasting, business, you know, so it's just where it is, but I, but I'm working on that, you know. So we're we're getting closer. Jeff, is there any job that you could get that would pay for part of your uh, PhD to well, be, do that at night or something like that? Not really. I mean, there is maybe some. I mean, that's the idea in the traditional field. You know, is for people that go traditionally, and I, what I'm talking about is. They get out of high school, they go to college and get a BA in history, and then they get an MA in history, and then they go somewhere and get a PhD, and when they have their MA, they let them be like a TA, or they let them teach some undergraduate courses because they're a doctoral candidate there, and they pay them some for it, give them some grants. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it's, what I'm doing is incredibly difficult to do as an adult. <laughs> You know, I mean, I, I mean, not that people that are, you know, 26 or 27 aren't adults. I'm just saying they're in a program and in a path where those things are open to them and are able to do it. It's just it's almost impo it's just almost impossible for me to do what they're doing because I didn't make the decision to do it until I was 26 or 27. You know, and then all of a sudden it was like, oh, I want to go do this. Did it but, used to be easier years ago? Yeah, maybe. But, you know. The problem is, by the time I really started getting a lot of education, I mean, I was already married, and, you know, I owned a home, and I had a lot of commitments in life that really couldn't go away, uh, you know, without super, you know, enormous changes. So that made it really too difficult, you know. To, it's, just, it's not impossible. It's just, it's just harder. I just have to take a different path. Yeah. than, you know, most people. But, you know, some of these colleges now are awakening to a lot more of this kind of education, uh, if for no other reason than the fact that, you know, my money is just as good as anybody else's. Um, in fact, I pay cash. So, you know, they're they're like, yeah, that's fine. But, you know, I think they're starting to understand that, you know, not everyone has to go through that path. So they'll work with you and, you know, they understand. Uh, a lot of them do, you know, I mean, somewhere like Harvard or something doesn't, but a lot of the, you know, where I'm going to go is a larger, well-known, you know, university. So, um, but I'm able, able to fulfill it, 
but it, it is harder. I mean, it's just it's just more work. It's just different. Well, you know, I mean, I, what's interesting is today to teach high school, I think you have to have a master's. Um, you don't have to, but uh, you'll you'll get. I mean, maybe some states require well, none. I don't instance, think any Marjorie, do. You have to have a bachelor's. Marjorie, uh, and I never consider this, but she has a master's. Mm -hmm. You know, because she was te a teacher. That's and good. I think she was teaching while she was getting the master's. But she yeah, a lot of them do that. Yeah, well, some of them help you pay she, for it. She and that got sort a of thing. master's. She never uses it for anything now. Yeah. Or, you know. Well. I mean, the thing about that education on that is you, you have to have a bachelor's degree to teach uh, in high school. Public schools are really even private, you know, uh, and all that. Basically, I mean, every state can make their own rules, but in almost all the states, as far as I know, it's a bachelor's. You don't have to have a master's, but if you want to go back and get one, they'll help you. And a lot of times you get paid more. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times it is a real leg up if you want to move out of the classroom and into administration, such as, you know, a principal or assistant superintendents and things like that. But the, the real hold up in a yeah. lot of states is you have to have a license to teach. You have to have a teaching license. And that's the real hold up in my state. In order to get a license in my state, it requires a lot of like internship hours and volunteer hours where you're like in a classroom for a week at a time and you're observing and then maybe you teach with someone else watching and all that but all that stuff is unpaid you know i mean i would i i can't take a week of my vacation to go somewhere and teach high school kids for free and then do it i mean you've got to do like hundreds of hours of this and I, I, I don't see it as worth it, you know, to go teach in a public school where I basically am going to end up taking a $25,000 a year pay cut to start out with. Because even though I have all the education and even though I have the license, I'm just a person who's never taught anywhere before. Right? You know what I mean? And yeah, they really love those people coming out of college. I mean, well, they uh, love you, them coming out know, of college. The older don't... you get, the less people look at you. I mean, well, you know why? Because you're older and you expect more money. Yeah. And they want the cheapest people they can lay their hands yeah, on. Yeah, and you kind of also can't be pushed around, if you will, you know, because you're like, no, nah, that's not, not really the way it works. You know, I mean, or, or, you know, nah, I've got some options. See you later. I mean, look, the company that I work for on the engineering side and stuff, they, they love to get these young people that just graduated who are like, oh, you'll pay me $65,000 a year, that's great, you know, like, and I couldn't live on that. I mean, so, you know, so they have this leg up on you. The license is very hard to get. And, you know, I looked into it before. I don't, I wouldn't really want to teach in public schools, you know, and that's a political conversation, I guess, because I just find it ridiculous, this, the garbage they have to put up with. Mm. But, when I did look at the license one time before a university that offers a program where you can go get it, the gentleman told me, he's like, and he was just very honest, he's like, listen, this is what your education's in, and you're completely qualified, and you would want to teach history or social studies or government, you know, he's like, but it's not going to work, because everybody who teaches that stuff in public schools is almost always a man, and they pretty much get the job because they want to coach sports and <laughs> high school typically hire the teachers to coach their sports first before they take people off the street he's like I'm, you know he was just being serious he's like i'm serious he's like so many of your social studies teachers and history teachers and all that he's like they're the baseball coach the football coach he's like so there's just all kinds of men who apply for those jobs he's like now what they don't have are English teachers. What they don't have are math teachers. You know, so he's like, if you want to teach algebra, I could probably get you a job a half hour after you get your license. But if you want to teach social studies, he's like, it's you and 60 other guys applying for that job. In, 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 high, schools, in, high, in high schools, teachers who work as coaches, are they primarily for male sports, are they men? And for female sports, are they female? Or are there females who coach men's sports. I personally have never seen a female that was coaching men's sports, but I've seen a lot of men coaching girls' sports. You know, I've seen a lot of 
girls basketball coached by men. Um, there's a lot of track and field coaches that are men and, and have purview over both the uh, girls and boys side. Um, you know, some schools have like lacrosse and things like that. And I've seen a lot of that coached by men, even though, you know, on the girls side, um, softball, I've seen men coaching softball, you know, I'm just going based around my area. It's obviously, I'm sure different all around the country, but you know, it was just, I, I mean, the guy was just very blunt. He's just like, look, you know, I can get you into the program and you can get a license if you're willing to do all this and, and you can get through it. He's like, but you know, he's like, like he said, he's just like getting a job after that. He's like, you'll probably get a job, but it's not going to be what I, it's just going to be whatever. Like, you know, now if you wanted, like I said, if you want to teach algebra, they can't find algebra teachers. But I'm not qualified to teach that. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm, matter of fact, I'm probably the last person on the whole planet that you would want teaching your children that. I mean, you know, so, I mean, at least I'll admit it. I don't want to go do it as just a job, you know. But that's what they do now. They get, these kids go to college. They don't really graduate with degrees in a field, most of them. They get a degree in what's called like post-secondary education or a degree in education. And they will go teach somewhere. And the school systems kind of see them as able to teach multiple subjects and move them around. You don't have a lot of what they call like sub SMEs, like subject matter experts. Like this guy is a subject matter expert in history. He's going to teach history. They want you to be able to teach history for like two or three years and to be like, hey, the English teacher is leaving. Do you want to go? To, you know, they want they get a degree in like education. So they're kind of multifaceted. I mean, I don't personally like the model. I understand why the schools use it because they're thinking more like a business, you know, but I really don't think our schools should be run like a business. I mean, if you go to someone to teach you something, you would try to find the most knowledgeable person that you could, right? Not just someone who was kind of trained in the exercise of following the syllabus or following the the plan or whatever. Now, that's just the way that it is. I mean, and I don't know at all about it. I just have been exposed to it some. So if this some of this is wrong or different states, I mean, people should call you up and, you know, tell you. Yeah. So somebody Somebody has written here, um, uh, Alex's volume is very low compared to Josh. And then it says, can't hear Alex. I'm looking, and I'm putting out with a nice volume, whoever that is. And then it says, is this the show? Yeah, this is it. Nobody's calling tonight. We can hear you good uh, on the call. You yeah, know, I don't know yeah I'm sure you can. I'm looking, and I'm, I'm peeking mm -hmm. here. So if you got a problem out there, it's with what you're listening to or what you're listening on or how you've got it mixed or something because it isn't here. Um, you know, I did lower Josh's uh, volume a bit but so that we're equal. But, you know, I mean, uh, we're, we're, we're peaking about the same. And, yes, this is the show. I wonder where everybody is tonight. I wonder what the problem is. I don't know. I wonder if I should just give up. Well, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I, Brian I, uh, I OG Reynolds says the studio sounds fine. So you see, okay. You know, so the I'd only like thing to I, make some opinions, what? some uh, experience that a friend of mine has, and and even some of the things that I've done, but. Uh, this uh, woman, uh, who's a good friend of mine for a long time, uh, she uh, graduated high school and went around and uh, started teaching aerobics classes. And also, she worked for a liar company. And she ended up doing the finances of, that, of the company. And she did that for a long number of times until all of a sudden she's like 45 years old or something like this. And she goes, you know, I really want to go back to, to college and get a degree. And she did it. She found a place that she could do it. And it would be a part-time job. And she would continue 
with the job with the lawyer. Okay? Mm -hmm. So she effectively had two jobs, okay? One was was to be uh, assistant uh, for the lawyers, and the other one is working for, for this uh, university to teach you to get a degree, or, okay? And ultimately, she had to get a master's degree, uh, a tr traditional job, and then a, a master's degree. And after that, she started getting a part-time job working for a relatively small but nice uh, university. Uh, maybe it's not a university, maybe it's just a college, but it's a, a very well-known place in Connecticut. Um, and anyway, she had a specialty that she was really good about handling to communicating with these kids to kind of free teach them how to live with the rest of the world. You know, forget about yeah. college. What are you going to be like a human being? Okay. Well, you know, we've, we've, we've argued this for the longest time on this show, and that is that I see the, the, uh, the idea of telling a kid who's 18 years old, now you have to figure out what you want to do for the rest of your life. Right. Yeah. And the fact is that most kids don't know at 18 what they want to do with the rest of their life. I did. I was very lucky that way. But, you know, to tell them to do that, I think we should give them a couple of years off. We should let them retire for like three years, four years, until they grow up a little bit and they have an idea of what they want to do with their lives and, and not force them to go to college. Yeah. Um, you know, not, not that college is a bad thing, although I think it's maybe a big waste of money for some people, but it, it you know, um, uh, it is important that uh, people have a chance to figure out what they want to do in life and not be forced to make that decision when they're 18. Oh, I, I've decided I'm going to become a doctor. Well, is that re you got the rest of your life, you know? Uh, is that what you want to do for the rest of your life? Maybe not. Well. Yeah. Well, Alan always told you that, that he was going to go to medical school and he ended up becoming a a, a doctor, not a doctor, a cop. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, that kind of is, is what you say. A uh, couple of my friends whose children are, are uh, getting their, master, their de first degrees in engineering right now, and it was a four-year program, and they did very well. Mm -hmm. And they said, you know what, we want, to, we want to take an hour off, a year off, and travel a little bit. Yeah. Make their decisions. Even though they're thinking about they're going on for a master's program or whatever, but they don't want to do that right now. Yeah. Yep. It's not a bad idea. Well, yeah. For instance, uh, Josh, what did you study in college to be? Well, my undergraduate was in, in business management. Okay, so that's kind of what you were doing now. Uh, yeah, right. You know, so, I mean, it gave me some qualification to basically move up in the career fields, you know, that I was already in and, and always be qualified to, you know, go up to the next level. But after that point, uh, a year or two passed, and I decided, you know, this hobby that I had, I wanted to try to turn into a profession. And, and since then, that's when I've went back and got a lot of graduate education in the historical field. You there's know, a I woman, there's wanna... a person, Stanley, here, who yeah. is writing, uh, who brought up this topic? We did, you asshole. Um, <laughs> and this is refund time, and then he says, it must have been a slow news day. Was it a slow news day today? You know, I, I mean, uh, not too positive. Nothing really happened out of the ordinary that I'm aware of. I mean, not yeah. much has changed. I was asleep most of the day. But uh, there was no major news that, at least that I'm aware of. I mean, most of the coverage the last two days. I mean, Trump didn't say anything. I mean, Trump didn't say anything today. Yeah, not that I know of. I mean, most of the news coverage the last few days 
a lot of it revolved around the president's overseas trip and the the D-Day anniversary and yeah the celebrations. He went to Paris in, in Normandy. <clears throat> Let me ask you. Let me ask you a question. Uh, we've been uh, discussing this the last couple of nights, and you haven't been here. But uh, according to several people, uh, you know, they've been talking about Donald Trump is maybe going to choose Marco Rubio as his running mate. And according to some people who called here, uh, he can't do that because there's something in the Constitution that says. The president and vice president can't be from the same state. Is that, do you know that to be true? Well, I think they might be thinking of the original idea of how it worked in the original electoral college, but that stuff was changed with, you know, the 12th amendment. So um, I think I have to pull it over and make sure. You know, that I think they were thinking of that when the original Constitution, after the convention, or, you know, that was ratified, had some stipulations on how the Electoral College could vote and the candidates that they had to choose from not being from the same state and for president and vice president. Mm -hmm. But a lot of that has since been, you know, changed through various amendments in federal law so there's no law now to prevent really it, they said it was in the second amendment that's right that's what i heard the second yeah yeah i'm not sure well, the, the, i thought the second amendment had to do with guns didn't it uh, yes it well, does the, but there might be some other stuff there there's a pull up the language here that they might be referring to but i mean I think I think I asked Pam to take a look at it. She reread it. She goes, yeah. yeah we'll do a that's point now. Is that what it says, did she say? Yeah, she said that's in there, in the second uh, opinion. So, um, I'm definitely not the kind of guy to read those things over. So. Uh, I'm not. I mean, the Second Amendment simply just reads it, uh, you know, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. And that's so, it? Uh, make sure I'm on some kind of abbreviated copy here or whatever, but... Yeah, I'm not really sure what they, uh... <laughs> I mean, I think I understand what they were, you know, thinking there, but... Uh, you know, because the original setup of the Electoral College was pretty was pretty cumbersome, you know, and it had some rules about some of the ways that you had to vote. But the election of 1800 and the fact that the Electoral College drug out, you know, a ton of ballots, I can't remember how many, like 50 plus, and it took quite a while to determine who the president would be, Jefferson or John Adams. Uh, and Aaron Burr was very close in those uh, votes most of the time, too. It, it just took forever. And eventually Jefferson won with Burr as the vice president through some compromise. But after that election, there were some changes that were made to, uh, to that process to, to prevent that. So maybe they're referring to some of the original language. It's you know so maybe yeah. Charles called for that, but so will, Char uh, Charlie, yeah. can you hear us? Yes. Yes. Uh, I I have to. I'm we're training new umpires tomorrow. I got to be up at five o'clock in the morning, and I have to write payroll checks to all the umpires tonight. That's why I'm not on. But I want to read you the 12th Amendment. Mm -hmm. Electors shall meet in their respective states and vote by ballot for president and vice president, one of whom at least shall not be an inhabitant of the same state. So they cannot. That's the 12th Amendment. That was the change. Well, the 12th Amendment. Right. It wasn't the Second Amendment. It's the 12th Amendment. And it says you cannot have the president and vice president come from the same state. And that has not been changed in any other amendment 
subsequent to that. That's why Dick Cheney had to move to Wisconsin to Wyoming from Texas because he could not be vice president to George W. Bush if he lived in Texas. Wow. Okay. What do you think, Josh? We go to Josh on matters of the Constitution, but U.S. Constitution. Well, you carrying carrying that around all the time, aren't you? Yes, I do. Uh, Twelfth Amendment. That's first. The first statement of the Twelfth Amendment is you got you got to have the president and vice president from two different states. Somebody wrote here: Donald Trump's hush money conviction could be thrown out on a mistrial after a Facebook post. Uh, what? what I don't was that about that. that yeah. Well, somebody did it in your name, wrote that in your name. In my name? Yeah, Charlie. Well, that's a different Charlie because, no, I, I, I haven't been on Facebook. I haven't been reading the news. I've been working my ass off on this umpire crap because, like I said, we're training new umpires tomorrow. I got to be up at 5 o'clock in the morning. They can't train them during the day. Why do you have to be up at 5 in the morning to to train? I got to get up at 5 o'clock because it starts at 7. And I got to drive across town to get there. Oh, boy. (laughs) Yeah. I guess because they don't want to. You don't sound happy about this. No, I don't like it when they do this. It drives me crazy. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) This is time like this is when I think about it's time to quit this job. (laughs) <laughs> does it pay that much i get paid 333 dollars a month no it doesn't pay that no much. it doesn't it's a volunteer job <laughs> and you're how old well you're getting social security i'm 74 years old i'm the oldest umpire in austin right now really <laughs> yeah do they look up to you uh, as far as my expertise, I'm firing on the field, yes. Because yeah. I've, I've been doing this for 38 years. <laughs> well, I don't want to force you to stay here because I know you uh, you have to get up early, and I understand that. Yeah, so anyway, I'm going to have to miss Amy tonight, too. Because of that. Yeah, well, who knows if Amy's going to... Because, you know, last night, Amy's show didn't go out. Oh, no. No, well, it went out, but it was only her side of the conversation. Nobody else was oh, wow. heard. Oh, boy. All my jokes didn't go out, huh? No, none of your jokes <laughs> went out. You know. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's all right. Yeah. We had fun. Yeah, yeah, well, I guess you did. You know, that's good. Anyway. Well, you get on your way and get, get to sleep. Oh, okay. And... Well, thanks. I just wanted to, to mention that. So. Uh... You must be getting t- a tan as well as your in- initial color, because I'm looking at where your wristwatch yeah, was. Yeah, I can see where my watch is on when I'm umpiring, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's good. <laughs> anyway, take care, Charlie. Thank you All so right. much for calling. We one. appreciate it. Great okay. weekend, guys. Okay, okay. bye-bye. Okay. And we're back to two people. Um, mm-hmm. But that's, that's okay, you know. Well, we, I talked to my uh, source of information yeah and i was trying to get her to come out here and talk to you about it but she was in the be- in the bed halfway asleep oh okay she wasn't going to change her well, class well charlie we got it it's in the 12th amendment now you know in the 12th amendment. yeah and what did, uh, what did it say i mean trump i'm sure can has some residency easily attainable in New York. Well, is he a resident of New York now, though, technically? Well, that's I mean, why I always ask, where does he really live? What, what? I mean, you can change residency from one state to the other in a matter of days. Yeah. I mean, he already owns a home there. You know, I mean, all, all he has to do is get a get an identification from a different... I mean, your ID basically, you know, determines your residency for most purposes i mean you don't even have to you know it doesn't have to be registered to vote in new york to to be a, a resident there i mean you know that doesn't have any i mean there are plenty of people that aren't registered to vote in the state they're a resident of but uh i mean that's not that much of a problem for him if that's how he wants it to go you know i mean that's right uh 
I don't see that, you know, it would have some sort of adverse effect on him in, in that way. I mean, if that's who he wants, it's easily enough changed. I mean, I don't think, you know, I mean, the left probably shouldn't try to make too big a deal about it. Uh, because, I, I mean, I don't see that it really changes much. But, you know, in spirit, I think we've moved well past a lot of that, you know, for yeah. purposes. I don't, you know, to us personally, I mean, laws are laws, but, you know, I don't see, I mean, it doesn't bother me. We, we were talking, we uh, bringing up something else we were talking about last night, uh, and I was hoping you would be there because, again, this is another question of, of constitutional rights. There's this whole trial going on with Hunter Biden, and one of the arguments being made is he's on trial for having uh, filled out a federal form to get a gun in which he said he did not have a drug habit, basically. Mm -hmm. um, I brought up the question, should that question be legal to ask? Because isn't that asking you to self-incriminate yourself? In other words, isn't that self-incrimination? If you're if you if you're forced to admit that you have a drug problem and that you buy drugs basically to serve that habit. Well, I think that I mean that'll probably fall under a couple different avenues because you know one of the things you know like with un unreasonable search and seizures and things like that is whether or not you have a reasonable expectation of privacy in a certain matter I think most courts and judges would say if you're asking to buy a weapon and the states have laws that say you have to get a permit to get a weapon you don't really have a reasonable expectation of privacy when it comes to filling out the form you know because you're asking to do something that requires a permit it's kind of like even though this isn't an illegal act, I'm just saying, you know, like when when you go get a driver's license, I think they ask you about drugs. If I remember right, they do ask you, are you on any illegal stuff or whatever, however they word it. But they also ask you things about your medical history, you know, like do you have epilepsy? You know, and some people would argue under HIPAA laws, the government doesn't have any right to yeah, but I think they're, th know that's, that. That's a reasonable question, though, if you think about it, because... Right. Asking you if you have epilepsy, you might have an epileptic fit while driving a car, mm -hmm. okay? Right. And that could make you incapable of driving a car. But mm -hmm. asking you if you do drugs is asking you to admit that you are breaking the law. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, you know, kind of a stupid question in a way because most people are going to lie on the form. Yeah, but look what they're doing to Hunter Biden as a result. Right, correct, yeah, you know. And the other thing, too, is is it's a bit, you know, I don't know. In some ways, it's probably a bit hard to pursue because I don't remember exactly how the question was worded. But, for instance, you know, like if I asked you if you were addicted to drugs and you said no, but you were using drugs, well, addiction and using drugs is two totally different, you know, Addiction is probably, as far as I would understand it, defined by, you know, if you stop taking it, will you have medical consequences? You know? I mean, if you stop taking Percocet and nothing happens, you weren't addicted. Maybe you were dependent, but you weren't addicted. But if you stop taking Percocet after taking it every day for years, and all of a sudden you are dry heaving and have the chills, and, you know, I mean, you have medical problems, that's... I guess, you know, different. I mean, I'm not a doctor. They define it differently, but I'm just saying, like, practically. But, and then I don't remember, like, so I don't remember how the question was phrased, but, like, even if it asks, you know, like, are you currently using or anything? I mean, you know, uh, for all he knows, and how would you not prove, maybe he was using a lot of drugs, and the week that he bought the gun, he was, you know, I'm quitting drugs this week, and he hadn't taken anything for five or six days. So when he filled out the form, he says, no, I'm not on drugs right now. You know what? I'm quitting it. You know, and he was doing really great for like a week. And then all of a sudden, after he filled out the form, you know, he has a bad day. But, and he goes but back look, to look, at, look at the misery that it has, has befallen him as a result of this. 
you know, and uh, I agree with you. Most people, if they're on drugs, are not going to say, I'm using drugs, illegal right. substances. Yeah. You know, just not going to. Why? Self-incrimination. Isn't yeah. there, are, aren't there laws, isn't there constitutional laws against self-incrimination? Well, I mean, in the Fifth Amendment, basically, that you you have the right not to answer certain questions to law enforcement, and that you have the right not to be forced to testify, you know, against yourself. Well, that's you know, basically what you're doing when you fill out that form and, like that. and check. I mean, that. it's an interesting element, you know. I mean, it, it's. I'm just it's, wondering why his lawyers aren't bringing up that point. Well, I think the reason that they aren't is because courts have already, you know, basically settled the fact that this question is legitimate. It is allowed to be asked on the forms, and it's on the forms. I mean, wow. uh, you know, uh, I mean, uh, certainly anyone who was prosecuted for this ever, I'm sure at the very beginning there were some people who tried to make that argument. And said, just like there are people who have tried to make the argument that said, if you catch me running a red light on a red light camera, that's not fair. No human being watched me break the law. I have no right in that case to face my accuser because my accuser is a computer. And we can't call the computer in here to testify as to what he or she or it saw me do breaking the law. But courts have said, nope, you know what? Red light cameras are, they're good to go. You know, and, 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 and then people made the entrapment case against red light cameras and uh, speed detector you know things and such and, and court said nope we're that's you when you're driving around the law says you got to stop for red lights the law says you got to wear a seat belt they put cameras up for that when you're driving you don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy from those two devices because you're voluntarily getting in a car and driving around if you don't like that walk well they they, they maintain all the time that driving is not a privilege is not right. a right you know, yeah. it's a privilege given you by the state. Mm -hmm. And that if you don't live up to certain expectations, you know. Yeah. yeah. Now, what I have found, you know, pretty interesting is that the group of people, as the irony in this is like the group of people in the party that basically have argued for all this time about a literal unchecked right to own a weapon no matter freaking what, are now using the smallest, idiotiest, bittiest stipulation of owning a weapon to prosecute someone they don't like. You know? I mean, the people that are cheering on this prosecution, Republicans, okay, or at least the crazy ones, these people don't even think you should have to fill that form out, right? Right. I, I mean, seriously. I mean, most of these folks are not when it comes to owner, they don't think you should have to fill that form out, really, and have this background check. I mean, really, at heart. Now, some of them might say they do, so they look at least legitimate enough to run for office. But if you go ask these folks, they don't think you should have to fill out a form and tell the government you bought a weapon, let alone register the weapon and all that other crap, right? Mm. But now that now they're fine with using the form, to prosecute someone that they don't like. Yeah, that's that I'm telling a very you, good these point. folks don't right. But I'm, I mean, I'm just you and I oh, know they'll, they'll go. Oh, we we have, we should. The Second Amendment gives us a right to bear arms, and no matter what, we it's an inalienable right. Oh, by yeah. the way, Hunter Biden didn't fill this form out correctly. Therefore, yeah. he shouldn't have been given a gun. He had bought a gun on, on erroneous and blah 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 blah. And they right. were yelling at him. And these were all the right wingers who were defending the Second Amendment. Yes, that's and that's what I'm saying. And we just read, you know, uh, we just read the Second Amendment a second ago, and you know, uh, their argument would be it doesn't say anything in there about whether or not you're on drugs, you know, <laughs> I mean, right? You know, it doesn't say anything in there about that. Uh, it, it, you, yeah, you but have, who has you can pressed, be on drugs without a weapon? Who has you know? pressed this charge against Hunter Biden? Who's pushed it to get it done? They originally were just going to let it go. Okay, yeah, they had and then deal. here come the Republicans yelling and screaming. Well, these are the your Second Amendment rights people who are saying we got to nail this guy because he didn't fill out the form correctly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is that right? That's we that, don't I live mean, in a democracy; we live in a hypocrisy. Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, I just, I guess I don't know why, but like I just observed that really when all this got going, that like the 
what I just found so interesting about it was the fact that it was like, man, you know, you know, and any on any other day of the week, these folks would be like, you know what, this this we don't need this form. You need to tear those up, throw them in the shredder. If you want to buy a weapon, you should be able to walk into a store and say, I want that one. And as long as you've got the cash, they and you're you know over eighteen, they should hand it to you. Uh, I know some people that would say you shouldn't even have to be eighteen. It doesn't say anything in the Constitution about your age, right? It just says. You're a citizen, you can you can own a weapon. Well, a citizen is anyone who was born in the United States of America, right? Or, you know, has gone through the process. So if you're 12 years old and you want to buy and a gun... And by the way, that Second Amendment doesn't say anything about except if you're a drug user. Correct. You know, right. that's what I'm saying. You know, so, but now, I mean, that, I'm, that would be their argument. I, I mean, I think that we know that uh, a lot of people will probably concede that. But now that even past all that now it's like oh he didn't fill the form out right shit we got him you know i mean you know, so i mean that's what i found really and like, they especially want to nail him now because trump got nailed yeah well right yeah you know oh, and, and on, on, on what they see as a technicality right oh he filled a form out wrong well you know i don't know that's exactly how i would describe it and apparently the people of Did New York. Did Trump get uh, indicted, you know? indicted and found guilty on a, uh, 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 what do you call it, on a, what was the term you just used? Uh, a technicality. A technicality, yeah. Yeah, I mean, they, that, that's how they try to phrase it, you know, the bookkeeping errors or whatever. I mean, uh, the, you, there's no proof that it was for... Well, here's the thing. That, here's the thing. Legal fees and, I mean, if come. I sign a check and it's for something illegal, I sign the check. You don't have an excuse. You know, it's not my dog ate my homework defense. Yeah, that's typically the way that it goes. I mean, unless you can absolutely convince someone of unwilling participation without knowledge, you know, you were scammed or what, but. He can't do that because, you know, as the prosecution offered evidence of, he's the guy running around telling everybody, I'm in charge here, I make all the decisions, you know. Yeah. He goes out of his way to tell people that, you, you know. So, I mean, and, you know, then you tied in the evidence from, uh, what's his name, his lawyer, Cohen, or whatever. And, and, you know, I mean, look, if you don't like the case, I can understand that you, you don't. But the fact is, the case was presented to... A grand jury first who voted to say we're okay with this indictment and then a jury second and again between a grand jury and a jury and its alternates there is no way there were not some ardent Trump loving people in those groups right and they still managed to get the job done mm -hmm. so I mean to me in a system where only it only takes one juror in 12 for you not to be convicted of a crime, the odds really are stacked against the state, which is why they have to prove that 12 people unanimously mm -hmm. that you committed a crime. Well, that's why we were so amazed by the result of that those 34 uh, felony uh, uh, accounts being found guilty, because mm -hmm. we expected maybe some of them would be guilty, some of them wouldn't be, you know? It was unanimous, and there was, on that jury, we know because he stepped forward, a Trump supporter, a Trump voter, yeah. who voted for yeah, the indictments. I, mm -hmm. I hadn't heard that, but... Um, but that one I, guy he, could have thrown the whole case out, yeah. and he didn't. Right, yeah, even if he just wanted to violate his oaths and everything, and just, just sit there with his arms folded, nope, 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 and nope. Never going to happen. I'm uh, never voting. So the so the chances that, were good uh, that Trump would be that. found not guilty, or, or at least a hung jury, because yeah. one person wasn't voting. Yeah. And like I said, it got past a grand jury, and then it got past, you know, a, a seated jury in a trial where Trump himself was able to put on a full defense with several lawyers, as many witnesses as they wanted to call, basically, and he himself would have had the opportunity to sit there and say his piece about it if he had wanted to. He cannot be denied that right. So, but he chose not to. 
you know, mm-hmm. which is up to him and his l- lawyers. So, yeah, that's why I don't, you know, this nonsense and, and, you know, really bullshit is what it is about, you know, this is akin to, you know, Castro's Cuba and, you know, I mean, I heard some high-ranking Republican lawmakers, I don't even remember which one it was, you know, saying, you know, to them this was the a direct equivalent, I mean, I'm verbatim here almost, you know, uh, to the show trials in the in the uh, late 1930s and uh, Stalin's Soviet Union, you know, where he purged all of his generals and things like that out of the military and sent them basically to, a to death. Dif- to a, a small difference they probably don't realize here is that there was a jury involved, you know? Yeah. And I mean, <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, it's that's what I'm saying. It's such... It's just absolutely. They, they keep talking terrible. about, you know, uh, this makes us a banana republic. To begin with, half these guys that are using that term don't even know what a banana republic right. is. Okay? That's that's for starters. Yeah. You know. Yeah, right. I mean, that's, yeah, you're right. It's, it's not, <laughs> it's not at all like that. But that's, look, that's their talking point. And, you know, Rubio was one of the ones talking it up like that. And, I mean, <laughs> he knows better. I mean, it just, it just, I, it makes me sick. He has no integrity, none whatsoever. Oh, you know? after all the things that Trump called him, now he's kissing his ass? Right. But, you what? know, his, his breakdown of the American system of justice and the jury system, all that, Trump it's, didn't Trump well, say, un-American. for instance, that uh, that uh, uh, Ted Cruz's father was part of the assassination plot against Kennedy? He made some and and about also that. said horrible things about his wife, and yeah. now he's kissing yeah. his ass. Yeah, right. Go figure. Yeah, I mean, you know, in, in a week when we're talking about a large group of men who were willing to give everything everything most of a lot many of whom did you know and and many others you know scarred for life who were willing to give everything to maintain the system of democratic governments and self-rule and freedom for the entire world we can't even get a politician this to act like they have respect and and honor and common sense for the American idea. I mean, it's it sickens me, you know? I mean, it really Well, does. I'm telling you now, it, if Trump better win this election, I'm saying this to the Republicans, Trump better win this election because if he doesn't, I think that's it for the Republican Party. I think they've so written themselves it, off with the American public that, you know... I mean, if, if it were to turn out that Biden were to be reelected and and the Democrats were to control both houses of Congress, to me, after all that they've said and all that's going on, that would be an incredible repudiation of all that. I mean, it would just be enormous, you know. And I really hope that's what happens because we're that hoping. should teach them that they've lost it all. I mean, so that'd be great. Yeah. Listen, I'm running the theme here. Uh, Thank you so much, Josh, for being here tonight and helping me do the show because nobody else decided to call it. And also, Jeff, thank you for being here as well. I appreciate it, and I appreciate your loyalty to this program and the fact that it turned into a pretty good hour of uh, of discussion. Uh, Thank you both. Why don't you both wave goodbye, and I'll wave goodbye at you. Okay. And there they go. That's our citizen panel for tonight. Uh, we'll, um, uh, there's going to be another citizen panel next with Amy Manuel. I haven't posted her show yet because I'm, uh, I do, you never know, okay? But it's up to her to do a show next. And uh, she'll be taking her calls at Skype, on Skype, at uh, GabNet Live. Uh, I will see you on Monday with the pop-up show where we get tons of people of uh, the pop-up show at 4 o'clock on, uh, on uh, Facebook. And so far as whether we're going to see you next Wednesday or not, well, we'll have to see about that because the way I feel about it, why? Nobody calls. So uh, maybe I'll just 
be happy with the Monday show. We may just take next week off as well. Anyway, that's it for us for tonight. Uh, stay tuned for Amy. She's next over most of the same gabnet. In the meantime, as always, if you see her, tell her I love her. Okay? Bye-bye. Good night, everybody.